good. I was just waiting for the computer to register that I pushed the record button mm -hmm. and that it should start recording, um, which it did after you said good morning to me. Oh. Hi, welcome back, everyone. Good morning. So my apologies for sounding so low energy yesterday. Um, I'm feeling a little better, so thank you, those of you who are concerned. Let's kick it off today, day four. We're going to be graphing, so yet more graphing gets you some good practice on it. But before we graph, I'd like to write the general form of our logarithms at the very top of the page. <coughs> I need a placeholder right here. You know, I'm going to call this C today because reasons. <coughs> okay. The reason why I went with C instead of our typical B that sits there is because then I would have two letter Bs in this equation and it would feel as if those were supposed to be the same value and they don't have to be. They can be anything they want to be. I'm using the letter B here as the base of the logarithm, base two, base 10, base uh, squirrel, <clears throat> whatever number you like. The rest of the letters should feel fairly familiar. Let's review them real quick. When I have some sort of coefficient out here in the front, what kinds of things does it control? Uh-huh. Compression. Um, this one is specific to one of those. Which one? It's a vertical, yeah. So that one out front controls the vertical compression, vertical stretch. It also controls a vertical reflect in x-axis. Good. This letter B is the base, so that's part of our function. That may change from function to function. Right now it's not. We're all playing in base 10. Um, but it could, okay? And it just creates a slightly different looking graph. This value in here, which today we're calling C for some reason, C for cool, in front of the X, what does it control? Horizontal? Yes, horizontal things. What kind of horizontal things? Stretch. Yeah, horizontal stretch or compress or reflect across the Y axis. Good. And this thing here, was that control? What was the translations? You're both correct. It controls where the vertical asymptote ends up because it is a horizontal left or right translation of some kind. Perfect. Getting at it from two different directions, all of it. And then this thing, what was that control? Vertical translation. Yeah, vertical translation, sifting this thing up or down some direction. Good. So there, we'll just be asking what kind of motions you see as a refresher because guess what's coming up really soon as I look over at the board on Thursday, right before I'm out of town on Friday, we're doing the transformations. So we'll be reading these and getting really specific. So warming up for that. All right, <clears throat> let's graph the thing. And I promise I'll do better for you guys than I did yesterday in explaining how to generate the points for the graph. All right, we need the vertical asymptote. You're going to grab this in here. The vertical asymptote is always going to be equation x equals, and it's going to be the opposite number of this. So if that's positive, you're going to make it a negative, unless you have something in the c position from our general form. If you have a minus sign in the c position, this thing does not change. All right, vertical asymptote at x equals negative 8. Lovely, I can graph that. Time for me to find three values. Three values, one of them is going to be on the asymptote just to like give you exact confirmation, oh yeah, this is exactly where I meant it. And the other two kind of give you a mas o menos, where the graph is going to end up. I'd like for us to, in fact, find four different points, one of which is the asymptote, okay? <coughs> Thinking back to when we did the exponentials and we grabbed four points, we looked at where the exponent was zero, where the exponent was one, 
um, where the exponent was 2 and then where the exponent was like a negative 1. Do you remember that? We found the 0 and then we stepped 2 to the right, 1 to the left usually, and that gave us our points to draw our graph. Okay? We're going to be doing sort of the same thing here with the logarithms. We're going to be grabbing the thing we're taking the log of. I haven't found a beautiful word for that. Sorry, I'll keep looking. So we're going to grab the thing we're taking the log of, and we're going to figure out where this value equals zero. Because this creates the asymptote. Okay. Solving that, we see that x is negative 8. So let me put that into the logarithm real quick for you so you can see why that generates our asymptote. So x is negative 8 here. So I'm going to do log. There's no base, so we assume it's base 10 log base 10 of <coughs> negative 8. I'm grabbing that negative 8 from the line above. Plus 8 minus 6. All right. Looking at this piece. That's 0. And we had our shortcut from, oh, I think it was Friday. I think last week, Friday, we discovered our new shortcut that whenever we take the log base anything of zero, it becomes undefined. Okay, there's our asymptote. Okay. So now that I have zero, the other three points that I want to find are these. I want to find the value of the base raised to the negative first power. I want to find the value of the base raised to the zero power. And I want to find the value of the base raised to the first power. Those are our three big points that will help us find out exactly where that thing curves. Okay? These two should be fairly easy. This value is one. This value is the base. So let's do that negative exponent one. That's the kind of weird one. Whenever we're evaluating anything with a negative exponent, take the base and write the reciprocal. The reciprocal of whole number 10 is 1 over 10. So I want values of the thing I'm taking the logarithm of to be these values right there. I want one thing I'm taking the logarithm to be value 1 over 10. I want another one to be 1, and I want another one to be 10. And those would generate our three points. Okay. Here's the thing I'm taking the log of. I want it to be 1 over 10. <coughs> Solve this equation, and I get that x... I'm subtracting 8 from both sides, by the way. Minus 8. Minus 8. Um, I get that x should be negative 7.9. There's some music happening in this area of the room. If that's yours, please turn that down. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's gone. Whoever turned again, I appreciate you. Okay? Cool? We're okay with how I got that. All right. So when x has the value negative 7.9, the thing inside the logarithm is going to collapse to one-tenth, okay? This means when I take log and I substitute this negative 7.9 into here, I don't have to think very hard about the arithmetic on this. I can just immediately write that, which is fantastic because one-tenth is the same as 10 to the negative 1. And now I have my shortcut set up from day 1, where I have the log of base, 2, and then I raise the base to some power. 
You remember that shortcut? And whenever I had this set up, my results was always that power. And so now I can take all of this and collapse it down to that. Take a moment to digest that and ask a question if you have one. I'm just kind of looking around at thinking faces right now. Good. I'm getting a few <coughs> nods of, yep, I get it. Okay. So now this first point is going to be at negative 7.9 comma negative 7. So there's one of the points that I'm going to be graphing. All right, going to do the other two points using the exact same concept, but I'm going to go just a little quicker, okay? So here I need to figure out what value of x creates a positive 1 when I subtract eight from both sides, I get that x should be negative seven. So then log of one minus seven. And I completely skipped over this step right here because I know I'm going to be using negative seven as my x. Do y'all want to see me write that step in so that you have it? Or are you okay with me just kind of skipping it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, I've got I've got one nod of I'm okay with you skipping it. Are you okay with me skipping it? Yeah? Okay. Now log base anything of one collapses down to zero. And so when x is negative seven, y is negative six. One last one to do. I need to figure out where x plus 8 equals 10. That happens at a positive 2. And so I can so immediately go from my equation here <coughs> to this. Because mentally I'm replacing x with 2, and I know that when x is 2, this thing right in here results in a 10. Why is it plus? I'm sorry? Why is it, Why is it a plus 2? Yeah, because I'm completely dumb and still on cold medication. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, an, it's a minus 6 because our original equation was a, a minus 6 up at the top of the thing and there. Thank you. All right, collapsing this down, log base anything to itself, of itself, the same base. So log base 10 of 10 collapses to a 1. So this is a negative 5. And so when x is 2, y is negative 5. I now have three points I can graph. Which are the four important things I needed? The vertical asymptote, three points. Cool? All right. Thank you for double checking my arithmetic on that, making sure I'm copying things down properly. Appreciate you. All right, I'm going to graph it. I'm going to graph my vertical asymptote at negative 8. And then I'm going to graph each one of these points. Okay, at negative 7.987 at negative. Seven, right next to six, and at two, at negative five. Okay, so my thing looks something like this, and I get to write that this is the log of x plus eight minus six. And that's what I was shooting for yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
much more clear than my first attempt with you guys. Oh, good. All right, let's chat real quick some of the characteristics that we see. I'll write them here for you, um, but you can write them wherever you've got space because there's another example for you to play with, and I want you to have some space for that in case you need it. So let's talk about translations here real quick. All right, what kind of motion does this give me? The blue thing. What's happening? Oh, uh, horizontal. Of horizontal? Horizontal what? Uh, translation. Horizontal translation. I think I misspelled horizontal. Sorry. I'll write shift eight units to which direction? Uh, to the left. Left. All right. And then this thing? Uh, vertical transition. This is a vertical shift. All right. How many units? Down six. Down six. Thank you, Miss. You're very welcome. Thank you. All righty. Let's get down to the bottom, because now that you're getting a better feel of the graphing it, we're going to try to find all of this information, the vertical asymptote. We'll talk domain and range. Um, we'll check to see if there's any kind of reflections. And we'll also look for compressions or stretches or translations of that, but off of just the equation, just like we did here. As a warm-up, let's look into this thing. What would be our domain and our range for this guy? The range is all real numbers. The range is all real numbers. So he said the range for this guy is all real numbers. And my domain. X is greater than 8, negative 8. X is greater than negative 8. Because if you see that negative 8 asymptote, we can't touch it, so we'll never <coughs> equal it. And since we're not going to cross it either, we can't be less than that. Do you see it on the graph? We're stuck <coughs> over here on the we're bigger than negative 8 side of the asymptote. So that forces our domain to be stuck in x is greater than negative 8. OK? All right. <coughs> so let's take a look at this guy. So I'm down at the bottom of the page. How about one more complicated than that? No. What do you think? Uh, the one on the bottom in the middle, P of X. That one looks like it's got a little bit of everything. All right, where's our vertical asymptote? It's located here, but we have to check do we have a negative right there in front of the x? I do, which means the vertical asymptote stays with that sign. We don't change the sign. If this was not present, this negative in front of the x, then we'd have to change the sign on the h. Vertical asymptote is at this with its sign present, at 2. That automatically gives us our domain. Our domain is going to be x in some relation to this number 2. I just have to figure out, is this less than 2 or greater than 2? How do you know? The x is smaller than 2. The x is smaller than 2? OK. Yeah, your, your feeling is not wrong. It's because we have this y reflect right here. The basic logarithmic graph, uh, our, our quote unquote parent function for logarithms, always has this thing on the greater than side of zero. Okay? So the domain is always going to be greater than. But uh, when I have a y reflex, it flips. Okay? So now this is going to be a less than. Good. What's its range? Yeah, always all real numbers.
Does it have a reflection? Uh huh. Does it have any other reflections? <coughs> and across the x. So reflections happen in the x and in the y axis. Good. Do we have any compressions? Do we have any stretches? Good. Do we have any horizontal translations? Yes. Two? Okay, which direction, left or right? It's usually always the opposite, yes? But the negative on the X makes it even more opposite than opposite. <laughs> yes, so it's to the right. You're absolutely correct. Right, two. Any vertical translations? Up three. Good. All right. You guys are masters at this. I'm going to pause it here, call it a day. You guys are fantastic. Thank you very much.